think it's live, I can start talking. And obviously, worst case scenario, there's a bit of a delay, and then um, and then we can crop it live after the live. Really but start. basically, um, I think you should make it go live when you think it's time. Just say, okay, it's live, and then I'll kind of start. Basically. Yeah, no worries. I think there's like there's 32 people already watching. So I know. I mean, there's there's 26 of us in the call, so oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> might might be might be eight watching. <laughs> Um, yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna so just let oh. me know when it's ready? Okay, I think that's it. Live. That's it. Setting up live now. Um, okay, so I think we're live. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so uh, hopefully we're live. It seems as though we are. Yeah, great. So, uh, welcome everyone to this week's reading group. Uh, very happy for uh, Ved. Worst to case be, scenario, um, there's a bit of a delay. Uh, presenting, and then, um, um, and then we can cross it. Live so, so, so basically, I'll now I think you should make it go live um, when we'll you think it's time. Through, just say, yeah, so "Okay, it's that. live," and then I'll. Yep. Thanks, Sam. Um, so, yep. Yeah, uh, I'm late for closing, and I'll be doing today. I know. I mean, there's 26 of us in the call, so I'll just share the slides first. So. Also, what I'll quickly say again, sorry, just to just to reiterate, is that uh, for anyone that stumbled across on, on Discord and, and people that are listening in, then on the YouTube itself, um, if you ask questions, we'll keep a tab on those and we'll make sure to answer those as we go through and keep things quite conversational. So, yeah, no, no, uh, feel free to ask as many questions as, as anyone has. Okay, awesome, cool. Yeah. Yep. Um, so as. As you can see, uh, the paper today is Elastic Decision Transformers. Um, this is a paper I was really curious about this week, and that the answer to bring it to my notice. Uh, I'll probably make a start now. So uh, today we'll be just like this is what we'll be doing. So first we'll just kind of get a basic idea of what uh, Elastic Decision Transformers are. Uh, then we'll just so just to accommodate all audiences, we'll just go through a bit. Uh, go through a bit about transformers and reinforcement learning, and also a bit about model-based reinforcement learning, just so that we accommodate all audiences. Then uh, we'll uh, dive into the decision transformer, which is kind of a predecessor to the elastic decision transformer. And based on my understanding, it has an even bigger technical contribution than the elastic decision uh, transformer. Uh, so we'd be going through that first. Now. And in the end, we'll so, just be uh, we'll know, be connecting just, the dots. Like This is what uh, we'll be doing. So going first, we'll just kind of get a basic itself. idea of what so, uh, yeah, elastic let's, decision let's transformers are. Uh, then so we'll this is the basic idea of what uh, the elastic uh, decision transformers are. So as I said, the elastic decision transformer had a predecessor called decision transformer which uh, treated reinforcement learning as a sequence modeling task. And by doing so, this opened the way to use transformers to perform the reinforcement learning task. And this, is uh, this, is, this was, kind, according to me, one of uh, an even bigger technical contribution than what el elastic decision transformers are doing. Uh, but then there were a number of limitations which were identified in decision transformers as a result of which we have elastic decision transformers. So there's this concept called trajectory switch, uh, stitching, which is kind of a, a limitation of decision transformers. And we'll look into what it is exactly. But that is actually the problem which uh, was being solved through the elastic decision, decision transformer paper. So yep, just, just for a bit of background knowledge. Uh, so this is what a transformer is. It's kind of an encoder decoder architecture for performing sequence modeling tasks, which is based on self-attention. Uh, you can read the paper which uh, came in uh, in 2016 or 2017. Um, and obviously, there were a number of models which were built on top of the or using the idea of a transformer. So just listing a couple of them to just uh, classify it into categories. So in case of Word, you have a stack of encoders, whereas in uh, GPT, you have a stack of decoders. So these were kind of just, just to in case anyone isn't as aware about transformers, probably you should. Uh, look a bit. Uh, look at. Look up a bit about like what it is about. Um, then now we'll talk a bit about the basics of reinforcement learning, just in case anyone isn't aware about that. So this is what essentially signifies like what reinforcement learning is about. So there are a few crucial components. So obviously the agent, which is kind of the entity which interacts with the environment by taking certain actions. The environment is anything outside the agent. 
so it can be a part of the agent uh, it can be a, the part of the agent structure but not interacting with the, en the environment even in that case that part would still be a part of the environment a uh, state is just an observable representation of the environment action is some decision or choice made at a particular state to modify the environment at, by an agent a uh, pervert function is a particular numerical advantage or a numerical benefit based on the action which was taken and this is more of a short term benefit based on the action which was taken immediately and then when you do accumulation of all of those rewards over a particular uh, sequence of decisions based on that you want to decide how good a particular decision was based on how much of reward you got eventually and that cumulative reward is essentially the value function so and there are two kinds of value functions which are the main two kinds of value functions popular so first is the state value function where you compute the value of a particular state which is the expected reward which you would get by taking any action from that particular state whereas the action value function or also called the q function is when you are at a particular state and then you take a particular action and then you compute the maximum expected reward you would you would get from the next state onwards following whatever was the policy so the pi which you are seeing in those functions is actually the policy which is what directs the agent to take a particular action and this is just kind of a diagram of what it is about uh, and just for a bit of classification there are a number of ways in which reinforcement uh, learning can be classified but we'd we'll go into the major ones right now just uh, which are more relevant to what we'll be discussing afterwards so based on the environment dynamics we either classify reinforcement learning into model free or model based so when it is model free then there it it is done like there is no specific model of the environment so you cannot predict the next state of the environment so there are a number of methods like uh, q function monte carlo etc which rely on the previous experiences which you've had because you cannot model what the environment is whereas the one which we'll be focusing on is model based when you have a mathematical model of the environment and you can predict what the state of the environment is going to be by some mathematical model so that uh, so that is one thing secondly uh, based on the agent environment interaction there can be two classifications such as online and offline so online is when you are interacting in real time with the environment and this is something which uh, requires the environment to be readily available for interaction whereas the more feasible approach for training uh, models is the offline approach where you have a particular set of data based on some experiences of the past and you use that instead because your environment wasn't readily uh, available or real time interactions were not easy or they were costly or limited so that is basically the there are there are other ways of classifying the on policy off policy etc but right now we won't go into that we'll just focus on these two uh, because that's more relevant to what we'll be discussing next so uh, just so that it's a softer landing to decision transformers we'll just kind of go through a basic example of uh, what model based reinforcement learning is so this is just kind of an example of the paper which came in which was trying to use reinforcement model model based reinforcement learning for uh, the atari games so basically what the model based reinforcement learning as i said does is you have a mathematical model of the environment and the benefit with that is you have certain information which is encoded in the environment which the uh, which the agent doesn't need to explicitly have uh, received in its policy and that is basically what the world model in the diagram which you're seeing at the top signifies so basically the process is simple so the agent would start interacting with the environment following the latest policy which it had which is the orange box at the top which was initially in, which was initialized to random at the start the collected observations will then be used to train the current world model which is the agent's understanding of the environment as it's a model based approach and then the world model would actually be used to update the policy so the agent would update the policy by acting inside the world model and uh, basically that is how this uh, process would work now the one the image at the bottom is basically just trying to solve the problem of 
the Atari video game, uh, uh, the Atari video game task, where you just have a series of frames which you are which you have, which are available to you. You want to predict the next frame what it's going to be, so you just have this kind of funneling uh, unit-like approach where you are kind of downsampling the uh, the video frames which you had into a a lower dimension. Then you are using that to make a particular decision or take an action. And after that, you are trying to uh, upsample it back to the original one. And that uh, is basically what was done for this particular example. But on a higher level, model-based reinforcement learning is particularly just more importantly at the top diagram, where you have a particular world model which is available to you, which is the knowledge of the agent outside of the uh, outside of its policy. So that uh, that is the point which uh, I wanted to point uh, wanted to highlight a bit. Um, so now going to decision transformers. So decision transformers abstract the reinforcement learning task as a conditional sequence modeling problem, where you treat all the action uh, the states and the transitions and the actions which uh, the uh, actions which were taken. All of that is treated as a uh, as a sequence. And a sequence, uh, and that sequence is called as a trajectory, where you every trajectory essentially is uh, a, a state, then the action and the reward which you got, and then you concatenate that across all the time steps which you have, and then you use a causally masked transformer, i.e., an auto regressive model like GPT, to kind uh, to be able to predict the next reward based on the actions which were uh, taken or the state which we were at, the actions which were taken, etc. So this is what is the basic idea of uh, uh, the decision transformer. So there are a number of advantages with the decision transformer. Obviously, given that the credit value is uh, credit or the value assignment or the value which is associated with a particular state is assigned directly through self-attention. So as a result, you uh, can capture very long sequences or long relationships between different states and actions. Then secondly, we can bypass the need for uh, bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is essentially just to, uh, in simple terms. Bootstrapping is when you compute the uh, when you compare the expected uh, reward against the actual reward for every time step, and this is something which uh, can be a problem. There's this concept of a deadly triad uh, where you have bootstrapping, uh, then off policy learning and function approximation. And uh, if anyone's interested, they can look into that. But uh, currently, basically, we don't need to do that because we have the entire sequence uh, modeled through a transformer directly. Um, uh, there's also other techniques which used to be used before, which were model-free, like uh, temporal difference learning, where you would have to apply a certain discount factor when you updated the value function to the based on the previous time step. Whereas with transformers, you don't need to do that because all of it is handled through the attention mechanism. And obviously, it also uh, works well with sparse or distracted rewards as a result, because you are not applying discount uh, factors. And as a result, the uh, value would not be scaled down to a large extent. Um, so that is why they have pointed out that the using a transformer benefited them. And this is basically the way it would work. So every time step is treated as three tokens. The first token is the reward uh, or the, the future reward, uh, which you would get from that point onwards. The second uh, token is actually the state. And the third token is the action you take. And these three tokens, they are together treated as a single time step. So at every time step, we uh, use we have three tokens. And each token is essentially treated as a different modality. So for every modality, you apply a different embedding. So you have a number of uh, offline trajectories. As I said, we are training it in an offline manner because we do not, because in cases where training online isn't feasible and it's costly, then you uh, prefer to have a data set with you. So we just have a data set of offline trajectories, i.e. the reward, the state, and the action. And then you use that to predict the next action which should be taken. Through, uh, through a causal transformer like GPT. Then once you have done a causal transformer like GPT, then once you have done that, once you've done the forward pass, the losses for each of the time step is eventually averaged and normalized. 
to uh, kind of get the final result. Uh, now, for evaluation, we've ev they've evaluated it on two different kinds of data, uh, benchmarks. The first one was obviously the Atari one because uh, it has very high dimensional visual uh, inputs. Uh, and secondly, they had used the gymnasium uh, or formerly called uh, OpenAI Gym. Uh, they had used the D4RL benchmark from there, uh, which which is used for kind of offline reinforcement learning. Uh, and that is uh, essentially how they had implemented uh, the decision transformer. Now, going to de elastic decision transformers, there, is a, there's a, there are a number of problems with decision transformers itself. The first biggest problem is the inherent uh, kind of something inherent to transformers where or something inherent to the sequence modeling task where a sequence modeling task is mainly to train a uh, model to be able to predict the data uh, or to be able to reliably reproduce the data which was present in the training data set i.e if a, if the data in the training data set itself was mediocre the transformer would not be able to learn to improve upon it which is something which is uh, a, a need when you are uh, applying a reinforcement learning algorithm and this uh, biggest problem this problem is what is pointed out by trajectory stitching so trajectory stitching is kind of a data augmentation technique where you have a number of suboptimal paths i.e wrong moves which you can think of in a particular game and then you want to update or you want to use those suboptimal trajectories and you want to get an optimal one out of it by connecting uh, them by using some probabilistic logic uh, to connect two disconnected nodes in that trajectory. Now, the, the fact that you, uh, with sequence modeling, it cannot inherently, like it is inherently not meant to do that. It won't be able to connect it. And the biggest problem is most of the data which would be available for training offline would not be data which is high quality. So, oh, okay. So, uh, given that the data wouldn't be high quality, you want uh, you will have a lot of suboptimal paths. And given that your sequence model is not capable of improving upon it, you wouldn't be able to get an optimal uh, result out of it, even if you pass a number of suboptimal trajectories. So that is uh, that is kind of why we need uh, the elastic decision transformers. So this is the basic idea is like you have a number of past experiences or historical trajectories and you want to get rid of the uh, parts of the trajectory which weren't good moves or which were not which were unsuccessful moves you want to remove those so that you only pass the ones which are you only pass the optimal parts of those trajectories to the model so that it will draw, learn to uh, it would learn to find an optimal trajectory rather than uh, finding, uh, even if the data set has a number of suboptimal trajectories. So that is basically uh, what is the idea. So we have a, a particular loss function, which we, up, uh, or, uh, we update the objective of the regular decision transformer to make sure that the sequence is not just in the context of the input which was passed to get the reward, but we are maximizing the reward with respect to all possible lengths of the history, uh, which you, uh, all possi possible lengths of the history which you are passing uh, to a particular, like you, if you're passing the input, the sequence which you're passing to the transformer, we want to make sure that we only pick the historical trajectory for a particular input based on what was the maximum return which you would get at the end, uh, even if the sequence preceding it was suboptimal. So. Hang on, yeah. Nick, sorry, can I come in with a quick question? Um, because I'm I might just be being stupid, but I'm not fully fully following actually. So, um, yeah. maybe maybe to just kind of, um, well maybe could, could you potentially go back to the, the previous slide? Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's just yeah, okay, just this 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 general point. Um, so so obviously, um, sorry, just to kind of try to get get myself aligned and um with what's going on. So basically, um, with with things like um, um temporal difference learning and everything, you learn these value functions, You or, or you can do policy gradients directly and you don't need a, a value function yep. or, or a quality function if it's conditioned on actions. Um, so you don't, I mean, basically the original uh, de decision transformer, which actually I, I, I remember going through when it first came out a little bit, yep. um, basically does something that's yeah much simpler, which is 
Um, we don't need to explicitly model a value function or a quality function or, or even compute gradients which tell us yeah. how to incrementally improve the policy. All we need to do is um, look at a big offline data set and we need to learn basically the correlation or, or the causality between actions and rewards. And we can do that by simply conditioning a big um, uh, transformer model on states, yeah. actions, and rewards, and then, and then, um, and basically, then we 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 say that we want to get this reward in future, and then it predicts the actions that should be needed to get as those uh, rewards yeah. because you've trained on lots and lots of data that had true trajectories of states, actions, and rewards, and then you obviously just say, well, what if we want to get one that's good? What would the action be? And it kind of just learns the causality between the two just from a yeah. big offline data set, and this is kind of really impressive that it, that it doesn't you don't need to explicitly model the value function or anything like or or anything like this um, and you kind of therefore just almost like learn a model you kind of just learn the causality between actions and rewards and then you yep. can query, you can basically extract a policy from this big kind of network that understands the entire nuances between actions and rewards and you say well what's a good policy look like then um, makes yep. sense so just in terms of the problem I was looking quickly on the page um, just, just uh, so the paper is one thing obviously um, but they have these um, they have these, um, I can quickly link it here on the channel and also on, on YouTube if that's useful at all. Um, basically they have these graphs that show that actually it does sometimes achieve better than, um, so I'm just going to add it on the chat there. Um, yeah, so I just added it to the YouTube as well. Sorry, so, so basically um, when you scroll down to the very bottom, there's these graphs that show that um, in some cases, it was actually able to do better. In fact, it's the last sentence they say, furthermore, on some tasks such as Qbert and Sequest, we find decision transformer can actually extrapolate outside of the data set and the model policies achieving higher returns. So it has some ability to take a data set that didn't even ever achieve any trajectories with high reward, but still it's yeah. able to learn the causality. Maybe there's a very simple causality, which is like, take this many steps and you get this reward. And obviously it can then extrapolate because the you know, maybe it's it, it, there's nothing too nuanced to get better and better. Um, so it seems yeah. like it, it can do this to some extent. Um, and and obviously the point that Elastic Decision Transformers is making is that it, so I don't fully understand, maybe just so it fails in trajectory stitching and as a result, it can't improve, improve upon suboptimal historical trajectories. Is it historical yeah. in, I guess, historical in context of the trajectory itself? Or historical yep. in the learning process of training. Uh, historical in the trajectory, like in, in the trajectory, its trajectory. So the ones, the states and actions which follow it. Uh, okay, which got it. it. Got it. So, 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 so basically, if you have a trajectory, um, so, 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 so basically, what what it's saying is 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 like. So what that would mean in practice is if you have a decision transform, you have a transformer and you model it with inputs of low states, actions, rewards, and then suddenly yep. you start passing at high rewards, and you expect it to know how to suddenly change tune and, and start acting well yeah that's what it would not be able to do basically it's not able to kind of um yeah like so 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 it, but why would you say it can't improve upon suboptimal trajectories what does that mean in practice in the end does it just mean so, that so essentially as you said uh, we would have a number of uh occurrences of low reward uh kind of instances but when you're having a high reward instance, you want to make sure that the model would ignore the low reward ones when it's computing the uh, return for it. Whereas with a transformer by default, it would uh, consider all of those and you would not be able to ignore the moves which were suboptimal before because you have an optimal move right now and you, they want the model to learn to make an optimal move. So yeah. the thing which uh, elastic decision transformers would do is you add it, you would kind of train an objective function Using expect uh, using expectile regression to know what the maximal length should be, which you should follow before a particular event. So, say there were three moves which were decently optimal, and before that everything was uh, suboptimal. So, what you would do is you would just pick those the three before it, and only those would be used to make that decision. Whereas the rest would be ignored because if you don't ignore the eventual decision, would still be suboptimal. No, oh, sorry. So it's it's about. Again, maybe I'm being really silly, but is it about masking then? So you say that the ones before are ignored. Do you mean that when you're making the prediction of the next, so you condition it on the reward and you want to get an action predicted, the formulation is the same. Uh, are, yeah. are you saying that you only consider the, the the good moves before? They're the only things that are passed into the transformer and everything else is ignored? Is that is it like this? Um, it, it wouldn't be, like ignored wouldn't exactly mean that. So essentially if we go, there's, uh, 
if we go into this diagram. So what it would do is we would just consider all possible lengths, which we can, uh, or, or all possible feasible lengths, and we would compute the maximum reward which we could get, or the most preferable historical sequence out of it, which would be learned, and then the one which is, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, I was going to say, actually, no, I guess we're getting into future slides, that's okay, actually. I was, it was more just yeah. kind of understanding the problem a bit, but I think that already makes more sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I, I'll, I'll shut up now. Uh, yeah, sounds good. I'll let you go. <laughs> uh, so, basically, the main uh, kind of crux of uh, removing these negative or unsuccessful past experiences is based on the relationship of the quality of the path which was taken and the length of the history which is used for prediction. So if the quality which of the path which was taken before, if there were a number of suboptimal uh, steps, we would make sure that we only pick the length of the history which uh, for prediction, which would give us the maximum reward based on uh, the objective function which we are defining. So oh, sorry, another quick question, sorry, is this a training time or test time or both? Uh, so the objective function is obviously used at training, but the whole process of ignoring a particular uh, step is done at inference. So it's action. It's called action inference by, uh, in the paper, where it, all of this uh, handling, where you find the maxim, uh, the best possible length of history for a particular node, that would be decided at an inference, based on what uh, the maximum value which your uh, objective function. But gives but, but, so, but but does but does this impact the training time in general? So compared to decision transformers. Yep. that they do things differently when training the elastic decision transformer yeah so they they've, uh, so the training between uh, training is essentially the same between these two except for that additional uh, expectile regression objective which you add on uh, for your model so in the paper they've said it's minimal overhead over training but i guess it is not like obviously it is not uh, it would take more time for training than uh, a decision transformer but given that like given that we are eventually when we do inference we are getting rid of certain sections and we are only computing the result for a particular length we are making it more computationally efficient as well uh, eventually when you infer so okay. yeah so basically that is kind of uh, what they've at, at least that's what they are saying in the paper so i, sure. I guess yeah that's good um so this is kind of uh, just an example to demonstrate what is the benefit of having trajectory stitching so uh, if you see the diagram here, uh, and this is uh, this is this diagram is also present in the paper, where uh, a particular there are two different paths which are present in our data set. The first path is from the S T minus one uh, node to S T plus one node for the A type, and the second one is for the B type. So let's assume A and B as being two different elements in the data set. Now in the paper they say that the mod, uh, that a decision transformer would essentially not be able to find, like if both of these paths are suboptimal, a decision transformer would not be able to find a path from a T minus one A node to a T plus one B node. And according to, uh, based on the objective function which they are defining, you would just get rid of, uh, while computing the path, you would just get rid of the previous trajectory, uh, which would follow before S T, a T minus one A. And essentially you would be eventually uh, able to find the path from the A node to the B node if you have, uh, if you uh, get rid of that unnecessary uh, uh, process before it. So that is uh, kind of what is. Sorry, uh, is, is the yeah. analogy there that both A and B are both suboptimal? Because it looks like A, because yeah. A is green. It does that, no, so A is better, right? Yeah, because the value, so A is a good uh, one and B is yeah, a bad uh, one. Yeah, actually they have suggested that both of them could be suboptimal possibly. If you consider a possible case where both of them are suboptimal, a decision transformer would by, would by default kind of tend to connect S, um, like the A node to the A node, because that was the case in the data set when okay. they trained it. And whereas with, uh, if you kind of give the model that freedom. So it's, it's kind of, I guess it kind of comes down to the, like um, the, the how yeah. diverse the data set is in a way. Obviously with offline RL in general, you're always limited to what the data is, exactly. which is one of the big downsides of offline RL. You kind of can't generate yeah. new data on the fly, um, yeah. which is, yeah. Also, I, I mean, I still think, yeah, well, that, that's one of one of the downsides basically, but obviously the benefit is you then don't need to run like real experiments to training. You don't have to have your training and your action selection and your actual, actual exploration in the wild yeah. running in parallel. But um, but it seems like one of the main things is just that there are certain like default trajectories because I don't know how this is generated. It might be just from kind of expert examples or it might be from 
Uh, they are might they are, uh, in particular, they are medium examples. So we are kind of assuming that all of them are medium. They are not uh, considered to be expert examples because we want to kind of because the medium examples are more likely to have suboptimal paths. Than but basically, experts. I guess the idea is that going from B to A is certainly possible in design yeah. space, but it just doesn't happen as often as A to A or B to B. Generally, the kind yeah. of the connect the interconnections of trajectories are follow patterns which are much more limited than the scope of possibility in the space and directory yeah. stitching is just kind of a, a, well it seems like uh, on a high level at least it's a somewhat simple way of diversifying the data set to some extent yeah. because you basically yeah. like provided it's physically technically feasible you can just massively inflate the size of the data set like by doing this yeah exactly so uh, trajectory stitching itself is a data augmentation technique which uh, is being used quite a while uh, quite a quite a lot but in the paper they say that the decision transformer itself doesn't work well with uh, trajectory stitching so if you have these paths even even if you have uh, defined those paths while uh, in your trajectory even if you have uh, kind of connected those two it wouldn't be the decision transformer would not be able to model that path given that the uh, the original path which was passed which is connecting a nodes to a nodes is uh, is present in the data set Okay, I don't, I don't fully feel that, but I, I, I guess we can keep going. But, but like, but, but, but just in a nutshell, you're saying that just taking the offline RL data set and simply inflating its size and and also increasing its diversity by doing trajectory stitching as a one-time thing that you kind of do just to the data set, in then doing everything exactly the same, that doesn't really improve things. Yeah, that seems to be what they are suggesting in that because. They're saying that the model would fail trajectory stitching, i.e. if trajectory stitching is already done on the data set, should uh, kind of be what it implies, where you have uh, ensured that you have these additional paths which you're connecting, but given that, uh, but the decision transformer inherently is not able to pick it because it's only capable of reproducing what was already present in the original training data set. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, yeah, so... Uh, as I said, uh, the objective function which we are talking about is uh, is to me is an is for expectile regression where you want to train uh, a model to be able to predict the expectile of the distribution. So an expectile is essentially the mean uh, of a distribution if all the elements above that uh, above the original mean uh, were e upon one minus e times more probable than they are right now. So if that happens, then their eth uh, expectile of a particular uh, distribution will be uh, like will be that particular value, which would be that mean. Uh, if you scale up the probability of all values which follow the original mean by a by the given factor, so that is what uh, is signified by the the R tilde is which you have in the uh, on the left side. And as I said, this is per, uh, this is the process which is followed during inference. So you have trained your objective function already. So essentially what we are doing is we have a trajectory and we are kind of passing different possible lengths of it into uh, the function which we are using to compute uh, the compute the likelihood of that uh, trajectory giving us the maximum reward. So you are computing the reward for all of them using your function uh, for all possible lengths. Uh, and then you are uh, kind of computing the maximum of that. The one that... Is it that there's ever more than one? So, so basically, the like one index is for uh, okay. I think I didn't out written out somewhere. Um, and then and then we get these rewards and we we just compute the max. Also, just that 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 uh, brown max is that just a simple choose the max basically yeah it's it's a simple choose the max yeah choose the max and then we get the optimal length because that's the one that um yeah but the reward also I, i'm i i think we just i mean to be honest, maybe i'm i i just should have read the paper beforehand so uh, apologies for that yeah. but um but the the reward is can is the input right so so we pass the re desired reward and we get the action so where is this reward even coming from? Where, where are these green rewards uh, coming from? So these green rewards is like for a, like 
uh, if you look at the rewards actually in the yellow boxes, the N1, um, yeah. Because like my, my understanding is, and and I mean, I read the first decision transformer um, when it yeah. came out. I've not read the elastic one, but like obviously kind of what happens generally is that you, you define the reward you want to get, and then that's when you basically choose, and then you get the actions. And I guess maybe what this is, is the reward that you actually do get by rolling out. Maybe it's kind of like, maybe you do some policy rollout in the environment. That obviously only works if you have a, if you have a good yeah. model of the environment or, or the environment is like fully gamified um but yeah i mean obviously we could keep, keep going forward obviously no, no need to kind of get completely held up but um i might need to just look a bit in the is this an image in the paper yeah it's an image in the paper yeah, yeah i'll have a bit of a look on the side actually maybe and just just try and make a bit of sense of that because because i don't know where the r's come from it seems like unless you actually test out and roll out how well it does um unless these are the rewards that you get as part of your past trajectory or something unless maybe because you have one you have like all of these R's from your previous history and you're kind of sampling which of those is, is better or something like this. Um, yeah. And which of your previous trajectory ended up on the previous reward because then you just literally have all of it. But yeah, but but um, maybe maybe keep going and I'll, I'll dive into that a bit because I am i don't follow something. Yeah. Yet, yeah. Yep, sure. Uh, yeah. Okay, so yep, essentially what the goal which they are saying is achieved has been the data isn't involving a number of optimal actions uh, and the actions are suboptimal even in that case the elastic decision transformer is better positioned to be able to uh, model the or come up with optimal uh, optimal moves or optimal trajectories uh, since the second thing which they are suggesting is they uh, the list or the the length of the history can be variable because you are choosing what the length of the history is going to be based on uh, what length of the history you wanted to kind of you wanted to use. Um, and thirdly, then this is just kind of some observation which they had made about so they are pick, picking an expectile from zero to one, and uh, basically they're saying that the regression uh, is more accurate when the value is higher, whereas with lower values it it's kind of uh, it is kind of moving towards an, a mean squared error, which kind of points to uh, an inconsistency. Um, and yep, the final one is just kind of uh, where they're saying that trajectory switching is less frequent with medium replay. Uh, medium replay is essentially the replay buffer of an agent when it was trained towards moving to the medium policy as compared to the medium policy itself. So yeah, that's kind of what they suggested with that. And yep, I think that's all I had. So yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Ved. Um, so I'm uh, well, yeah. First of all, uh, yeah, really, really interesting paper. Um, I'm kind of keen to to dive even even deeper. Um, so I guess any any uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. Also, yeah. Uh, oh, I guess I don't know if that hand raise was an accidental applause. It usually is. Um, <laughs> so I'll assume that. Uh, that uh, Hader was <laughs> was trying to applause. Um, cool. Well, I guess before I I dive in with questions, um, any questions from anyone in the room? I'll also quickly check on YouTube to see if anyone has any questions. Um, but yeah, if, if there's any questions in the room, then feel free to uh, raise the hand. Um, I'll quickly have a look here. So no, just lots of people saying hello. Uh, lots of waves. Uh, uh, okay, so da, 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 no, lots of waving. So no, no questions online. Um, any questions in the room at all? Um, if so, then feel free to raise the hand. Otherwise, we can kind of discuss discuss a bit more, maybe. Um, yeah. So I guess I guess uh, <laughs> I asked all the questions exactly. That's true. <laughs> uh i yeah i have i have a tendency to do that uh, <laughs> um so yeah I, I guess um just just to to try and unpack this diagram a bit together i guess it says it says the figure illustrates maybe could you go back to that image with the diagram yes it says the figure illustrates the action inference procedure 
within the proposed elastic decision transformer. Initially, we estimate the value maximizer, R, I, for each length within the search space as delineated by the green rectangle. So this we would identify the maximum value from all R, I, which provides the optimal history length. Um, utilizing this optimal history length, we estimate the expert value at time step the, the estimate, we, we estimate the expert value at time step t. Um, okay, got it. In time step t is the time step we're at right now via Bayes' rule. Okay, um, finally, action prediction is accomplished via the causal transformer decoder, uh, which is this group. Uh, so the network is represented by this um, gray block on the right which is conditioned on the previous action and the previous observation. Um, and then um, in practice, we retain. Yeah, I think I think I might, I might need to dive a bit deeper into some of this actually, because I guess maybe um, we end, uh, I don't know how everybody's watching me reading it in detail the paper, it won't be very interesting, but um, yeah, I, I, I guess um, part of, part of the the kind of core stuff um haven't haven't i guess but my mental model are wrong my mental model is very much that um basically rl where there's all this fancy stuff where there's obviously q learning uh, and there's um policy gradients where you don't need to have a, a quality function you can actually just do i mean so basically on a high level um like td based learning is when you have a value function or a quality function and you literally learn the you like learn the reward function to some extent um or the value function um in policy gradients you don't need to do that you can optimize the policy directly where the, the network is basically conditioned on um yeah. conditioned on um state and action and if it's a markov decision process which means that the entire history is contained within the state then you just need a single state like chess or atari um if if the if, if um the entire context is not represented in this current state, like in a, in a game with the images, then you need an LSTM or something. And then you basically condition yeah. on the state and um, uh, and and you then predict the action. And, and the, the reward is not part of the uh, equation. The reward yeah. is basically what you're using to optimize the policy. Uh, and and similar with Q learning, you, you kind of predict the, um, the, the for a state and action. No, for, for um, yeah, a, a, a state and, and you then predict the action basically. No, you predict the value of taking a state and action in certain states. So yes, state and action, you, predict, you predict how good that is. And that can be discrete with kind of a binary, with, with, with a, a classification kind of loss basically. So you have a discrete set of um, uh, qualities um, or it can be continuous. Then you can like sample the continuous space, of the Q function. Anyway, so, so all of this is what people are doing before. And now, um, now basically we're saying actually no, what you can do particularly in offline setting where you don't need to like continue to do things on the fly is just have a state action um just have a sequence of previous um states and and rewards and an entire trajectory through the space and then you can basically say well i, I want to continue and you pass in the rewards as well as you go forward and then you can basically say well i want to continue getting this reward what is what are the actions that give me this reward and without doing anything fancy the entire like um, correlation and it, it, the, 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 yeah, the entire causality between actions and rewards is just learned from this offline data set basically. Yep. Um, so like, yeah, um, and, and um, what, like, I guess in a nutshell, just taking it back to like super basics, like obviously like it's not just improving the data set with trajectory stitching, it's more than that. Like maybe just like um, on a high level again um, for my, yeah my slow brain that hasn't read this paper like what's the main that's the main like thing in a high level that, that they do yep again. so they are essentially it's it's kind of like an lstm where you want to get rid of some historical unnecessary data where uh, and probably i remember now what I was, what this diagram was about so basically the 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 tau symbol that is the length which is relevant to you and you are trying to find all possible lengths which follow before it which are all which should be kept or should be removed so the r1 essentially is trying to see the uh, trying to see the value we would gain by having one uh, token one token ie the state action and reward before yeah. the selected section which you have 
Secondly, yeah. for the uh, Tau 2, for example, is when uh, you pick the last two and you consider that as the optimal uh, yeah. trajectory and you try to find how far you can go before it based on the length. So the the R, the index which R has, that is essentially the length which should be before this section which is relevant to us. And, and how do you get the R's then? May, again, maybe I'm being a bit silly, but, but the R's are something that you are the, the R is yeah where, where do the R's come from because I thought that the R is something that you basically choose as a desired reward basically when trying to get the actions where, where do these R values come from because you have your what you have in the blue is like this is what I've done this is the rewards and the actions the observations I have taken so far I'm now trying to make my next action like so where, yeah. where do these R's come from so it is kind of the uh, it is kind of the expectile of the distribution of the sections which we had selected up till now. Okay. So you want to kind of find all of those possible means if you scale up the probability of the values which follow the current mean. Okay. And you want okay. to find which one so, of so those it's like some pretty of basic, to one. So it's like some pretty basic yeah. statistics based on yeah. the previous re rewards you've got. Uh, not the previous reports, but the previous uh, kind of the previous sections which you're considering whether you want them to be considered suboptimal or optimal. So you consider that whole section uh, altogether, and you find you try to find the optimal expectile value using that uh, using the redirection model which you've trained before between zero to one about which value like uh, up to which uh, expectile you can. Uh, like you okay. can uh, you you can predict for that particular distribution. So, okay, I, I got it. Yep. So it's kind of like so it's just like there's some like and it, it's kind of not a neural network or something. It's a pretty like is it what does that model look like? I think it's uh, I I think it, I don't think they have actually used a model because they've just so they they just pointed it out as an objective function. So I suppose okay. whether it's an objective function of the transformer itself or whether they are using an external model because i don't think they're using an external model because they've also pointed out that the training process is exactly the same as the decision transformer except for this objective function so i suppose they are using they are just computing these uh, predicted these uh, predicted values um, or the uh, the they are regressing the expectiles and they are yeah. just uh, using using that to learn the transformer itself okay and, and then you get the optimal length and the optimal length is basically then the length going backwards from the current time step and only the most yeah. recent actions it's not like randomly selected from the block or like stitched or something yeah, no. it's just the last set yeah, the, last the last n yeah. or t steps basically which you would consider optimal for this particular section which you are using or okay. this particular action which you're at yeah okay it seems like a bit like kind of almost like just like I don't know what the word would be, but almost like Bayesian networks or something, or like dropout or something, or I don't know, you're kind of like sampling all kinds of different ways in which you can query the network, and, and some of them are going to give you better performance than others, or something like this, um, kind of. I mean, yeah, you, you kind of can just extend the ways that you can query this to some extent. Yep. Um, yeah, um, and then you get the, okay, um, and then you get, yeah, okay um yeah and then and then and then maybe just a last word again on um yeah uh, the the base rule point again maybe just like and that as to as, as one thing to wrap up just a, a few more words on that would be quite helpful i think yep so this is something which they are kind of picking similar to what you had in the decision transformer as well where you kind of retained certain prior information about the uh okay hold on just a second yeah, it's I'm just kind of going through it now. Um, maybe we should do the, the yeah. I think um, there's a lot of papers in this area we can do. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we can we can kind of go in a bit more detail in the channel as well. Obviously, I don't want to keep everyone. Uh, tagging along um maybe but maybe maybe we can kind of unpack this a little bit more in the in the paper reading group channel as well actually because i'm quite keen to understand understand some of the details that's also a good a good uh maybe um a good a good thing because uh, there's lots still lots of overflow to discuss on this paper for sure um yeah 
also, I just so I don't hog the whole thing. Any any other um, small or large questions from anyone um, on the call? I think Yasser had a point. So, um, doesn't the way the problem was framed boils down to limitation uh, to imitation learning rather than actual reinforcement learning? Well, it's not quite. I think it's not like the same as behavioral cloning. Um, I think because it's based on state action reward yeah. although they, they do claim uh, although they do claim that you would have behavioral cloning over a particular subset of the data set uh, yeah. in, the, in the decision transformer itself that you would have behavioral cloning over a subset even if you train over the whole thing i think i think because you're trying to learn the causality between rewards and actions it ends up still being under the umbrella of offline reinforcement learning i guess reinforcement yeah. learning maybe i don't know exactly it's a bit of a semantic thing obviously typically reinforcement learning was all about um well it's always in learning online basically like on the fly when you're making actions in the environment and and doing things well and getting punished and doing things good and getting rewarded and that's kind of what it stems from i guess this is something in between but i think um unlike pure imitation learning where you kind of just have like good policies expert policies and you try to learn a policy normally the naive way would be to literally try to learn something conditioned on the state that predicts the best action and you just copy the actions that you saw that were good this is obviously kind of intertwining reward and action in a more like nuanced way um yeah yeah cool anyway well i guess we're i guess we can we can wrap up there uh, but yeah this is like piqued my interest to get back into rl i've run, read a ton of rl papers in in my time and and kind of keen to keen to kind of keep opening up more as, as well um yes yeah, so really uh, really well explained Thank, thanks a lot Bet. um any final questions or anything before we before we wrap up today no well we'll save them all for that uh okay so there's a there's a couple of more waves and stuff on the youtube so there's uh thanks bed bed you have a video of that stuff in action um yeah well we, we, let, let, let's maybe uh, well I, i'm gonna say maybe james um because i noticed actually in the in the description of this uh of the reading groups i think in all of the descriptions actually we should include a link or certainly to the original archive paper and the authors and the project page and any videos and stuff so uh we'll do that on the description of this video as well um yeah francisco we'll make sure to do that um and yeah maybe james actually just well on the call if you could do that for, if you could maybe do that for all of the reading group descriptions so we have all of the links to the original works that'd be really good as well actually uh, yeah yeah no sweat Thanks. Sounds good. Cool. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks a lot for joining everyone. Um, just on time. Uh, thanks, Bed, for going through that. Um, I know you're. <laughs> there's one of few people kind of volunteering to keep doing them. Uh, I'm going to do one soon as well. I, I promise. So we'll all uh, and we should all have a bit of a turn doing them. Uh, but yeah. Thanks a lot. And thanks everyone for joining. And yes, yeah, see everyone again uh, same time uh, next week. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.